Bible. So Sunday, the 14th of May, today, we are two weeks from Pentecost. Sunday, 28th of May is Pentecost, and Pentecost is the giving of the Holy, Holy Spirit in power to the disciples. It's the culmination of Jesus's work to get them from where they were after his death to the place where they would be the church born. And yeah, Pentecost is the birthday of the church. We might have cake. Seems like a good thing to do, have cake on a birthday. But we're two weeks away, and there's two more lessons in this Easter, this Easter series before we get to Pentecost. So as we're looking at the stories in the gospel this week and next week, we are looking at the work of Jesus restoring and calling his brothers and sisters, bringing them through his death, through the revelation of who he is, and bringing him to the place where them to the place where they see he defeated death, and that they will, as he said earlier, go and do greater things than him. So he's building them up. So let's listen to John 21 this morning. There was one other time when Jesus appeared to the, dis the disciples. This time it was by the Sea of Tiberias. And this is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas the twin, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, and two of the disciples were together. Simon told the others, I'm going fishing. They said, well, go, we'll come with you then. So together they went out in the boat. They fished through the night, but caught nothing. As day was breaking, Jesus was standing on the beach, but they didn't know who it was. My sons, he said, have you caught any fish? No. Throw your net on the starboard side of the boat then, and your net will find fish. They did as he said, and suddenly they could not lift their net because of the massive weight of the fish that filled it. The disciple loved by Jesus, it's John, just in case, we're not sure, turns to Peter and says, it's the Lord. Immediately, when Simon Peter heard these words, he threw on his shirt, which he would take off while he was working, and he dove into the sea. The rest of the disciples followed him, bringing in the boat and dragging in their net full of fish. They were close to the shore. They were only about 100 yards out. When they arrived on shore, they saw a charcoal fire laid with fish on the grill. And he had bread too. Bring some of your fish, Jesus said. Simon went back to the boat to unload the fish from the net. He pulled 153 large fish from the net. Despite the number, the net held without a tear. Jesus looked to them and said, come and join me for breakfast. Not one of them dared ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus took the bread and he gave it to each of them. And then he did the same with the fish. This was the third time the disciples had seen Jesus since his death and resurrection. They finished eating breakfast together. Jesus turned to Simon and said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Take care of my lambs, Jesus said. Jesus then asked him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you must surely know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep then. A third time, Jesus spoke. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because he'd asked the same question now three times. Do you love me? He looked to Jesus and said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. So Jesus said to him, look after my sheep. I'll tell you the truth. When you were younger, you would dress yourself. You would go where you pleased. But when you grow old, you'll stretch out your hand and someone else will dress you and take you to a place you don't want to go. Jesus said all of this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After that conversation, Jesus said, follow me. Peter turned around and he saw the disciple loved by Jesus following two of them. 
the same disciple who'd leaned against Jesus during their supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Peter turned to Jesus and said, Lord, what will happen to this man? And Jesus told him, if I choose for him to remain until I return, what difference does that make to you? You follow me. It's from that exchange that some thought the disciple would not die. But Jesus never said that. He said, if I choose for him to remain until I return, what difference will that make to you? That very disciple is the one who offers this truthful account written just for you. There are so many other things that Jesus said and did. If those accounts were also written down, the books would not be contained in the entire cosmos. So that's the reading this morning. Before we um, think about that together, we're going to sing once more. Let's sing All Heaven Declares. Thank you. The days have passed since Jerusalem. The disciples are back in Galilee, and we see seven of them on the shores of the lake. In previous weeks, as we've looked at those moments after Jesus' death, even when um, they understood that he wasn't just a ghost, but he was alive, he was in a new body, um, the, the closeness, the joy that they had felt in those moments, I think is gone back in Galilee now. They were worshipping in the temple day and day, the scriptures tell us, but at some point they decide to go home. They go back, unsure what to do. And Peter says, I think quite accurately, I'm going fishing. He goes back to his old life. And uh, as a modern day pastime, before we had kids, I quite liked fishing. Fishing is a great way to go and be outdoors, embracing peace, being in nature, maybe catching something you might like to eat, although it depends what the fish is. But Peter and the others fished not for pleasure. They weren't like with a line. They, they fished to make ends meet. It was their living. But that was before Jesus, wasn't it? When they met Jesus in that first scene, similar to this one, when they catch fish, at the end of it, Jesus says to them, you won't catch fish anymore. Now you'll be fishers of people. You'll be fishers of men. And I think that might be a good thing because I'm not sure they were very good fishermen anyway. But there they are. They'd spent all night and they'd caught nothing. And... I remember catching nothing for fun and it's not the best thing. You know, you'd go home, Claire would say, caught nothing again. And you'd be like, yeah, but it was nice because I was outside. And then secretly inside you'll go, well, oh, come on, why didn't I catch something? But for these men, they went back to what they knew and even what they knew wasn't working for them. And Jesus appears. And that's right. Jesus appears because they are not going back to catching fish. They are supposed to be catching men and he calls to them from the shore he's there i know it's hard sometimes to see jesus as their father but he calls them sons sons have you caught anything he addresses them as his children he loves them so much and they hadn't got a sardine between them the only thing that they caught was the smell of fishing and if you've ever been fishing even if you don't catch anything you somehow still smell of fish and fishing. But my sons, he shouts, have you got a whopper? No, nothing, they shout. Throw your nets on the other side of the boat. And in human terms, it is hilarious. You know, they've tried all night. We haven't caught anything on the port side. Throw the nets on the starboard side, you say. All right, then, we'll do that. And then the nets pull tight. Then the nets are full beyond what they could haul. And I want to suggest this 153 net f fish would have weighed a considerable amount because 153 sardines, we could haul that up between a few of us, seven of us. It's not that bad. But this is a big net of fish because the disciples then were strong people. These were people who'd spent three years with Jesus living on the road, 
walking everywhere. They didn't have public transport. They couldn't Uber down to Jerusalem. Everywhere they went was by their own means. They were physically fit men. The fact that they couldn't haul this net of fish out means it wasn't little fish. It was a big, massive haul. God had done something again to catch their attention. And John's heart sees this. And he says, Peter, it's the Lord. Peter puts his shirt on, jumps in, and gets to Jesus. It's kind of the reverse of the Daniel Craig Bond moment where he comes out of the water. He's bedraggled in his clothes. He's with Jesus. And I bet he's glowing again. Jesus is here. We didn't know what to do. And all of the other disciples, that must have been quite funny if you think about it. Six of them dragging a boat and 153 fish ashore, grounding it all and appearing in front of Jesus. What's going to happen now? Jesus has prepared a fire. He's prepared bread and he feeds his sons. And he even asks them to bring a little bit of the fish that they've brought. Now, writing this later, John tells us this is the third time, the third time they've been with the risen Lord Jesus since um, first seeing him. Now, six of them are about to feel a little bit uncomfortable with what follows, but one of them, Peter, have pretty much the most brutal and embarrassing type of conversation you could imagine. Now, I'm sure later, full of God and full of life, Peter would have read John's words, but think for a moment about how hard this conversation is for Peter. Um, you know, I, I've heard this passage before. You've heard it before, I'm sure. But I still remember over 30 years ago in my first church, I heard a sermon on this, and this was acted. One of the congregation, a guy called Phil, was an actor, and he acted Peter's part. And I still feel the heartbreak of the words from Peter's perspective as Phil acted them out. It's never really left me. Every time I read this, I, I, I remember Phil um, crying out in parts of this. Peter had colossally messed up so much and he thought he was all that for God when he met Jesus and he had failed. And the way Phil brought this out for me, it's just so powerful for me. But, you know, what we see here is a question asked three times and smart theologians say, oh, well, God's in three parts. So, you know, they, Jesus does it three times to make it sure. Other ones say, well, he denied Jesus three times. And so he asks him three times. And all those things might be true. But just imagine for a moment having failed Jesus the way Peter has having this conversation. Imagine. As Jesus has this conversation with him in his head, Peter imagines so much failure. Those moments where him and the other disciples almost fought for position and influence and power with Jesus. Those moments where Peter thought he was bigger than he really was, thought of himself in far less humble terms than he should before Jesus. And now he stands there and Jesus says to him, Peter, do you love me? And you know what? English is rubbish in this passage because we know for the, the Greek reading, there were different words for love. And he's asking Peter, Peter, would you lay down your life for me? That's the love. That's the agape love that's being spoken of here. Would you sacrifice yourself for me? Peter says, Jesus, I love you. But let's spoil the plot a bit. He doesn't say, Jesus, I love you. I'll lay down my life for you. He says, this is the moment where one of two of you might relate. Have you ever told someone that you love them and they've said, thank you? Slightly embarrassing, isn't it? I love you. Thank you. Or I love you. Yeah, yeah, you're all right. He says, Jesus, I love you like a brother. I love you like family. Doesn't say I'll lay down my life for him. So he says that. 
Jesus asks again. He buries in a second time and opens up the wound of Peter's denials. And he says, do you really love me? Would you really lay down your life for me? Peter in the past was glib and stupid enough to say, I've got a sword if everybody comes against us. Might even cut someone's ear off if they get close enough. I'll never abandon you, Jesus, if even if everybody else does. Do you remember Peter's words? Do you, will you lay down your life for me, Jesus says? Would you die and sacrifice yourself for me? And Peter says, because he knows Jesus is real and he's resurrected. Jesus, I love you like a brother. He doesn't say he would lay down his life again. Now, in the third version of this, third time it happens, we're told that Peter is truly hurt by Jesus asking him again. Let's just grasp the reality of that. Jesus asks if he loves him. Jesus says, Peter, third time, do you love me like a brother? Doesn't ask him if he would sacrifice himself because Peter's already given his honest, real answer. And as much as we can look at that and say, oh, Peter's upset because he's been asked three times, you can recognize that Peter's upset because he knows Jesus has dumbed down the question for him. He's made it easier. He hasn't said, Jesus, Peter, would you lay down your life for me? He says, Peter, do you really love me like a brother? He's responded with Peter's thank you with a question of equal value at a lower level. And Peter says, Jesus, you know all things. You know all things. I do love you as a brother. And Jesus tells him then to care for his sheep, to care for his people. Now, we're not going to get into Catholicism. But what we recognize here is Jesus tells his disciples to care for the people. And at that point, then, they haven't come, have they? Because we're not quite at Pentecost. But at Pentecost, the church explodes and they start to come and the disciples start to look after the people. Peter is restored to Jesus in this scene. And he was the greatest failure amongst a group of really good failures. And John writes this and John goes on to start churches which thrive and grow. The Johannine churches are a powerful force in the, in the early Christian church. They're wonderful. You know, they're not as big as the churches that God plants through Paul, but there are many of them. John was as much of a mess up as Peter almost. But this public failure is where Jesus comes in. You are failures, he says to these, these group, these seven, but I'm not. So come and follow me. You've made mistakes. I haven't. So come and follow me. You get it wrong. I don't. So come and follow me. And this is a wonderful restoration. And as we think of this story, we have to think of ourselves somewhat and a little critically, but also recognizing who we are because of Jesus. You know, we fail, don't we? We failed God. Any one of us who thinks we failed less than Peter needs to sober up. We fail God at the level that Peter and the disciples did. We failed God many times. I failed God a million times and I will keep failing God. And so will you. But being failures is not the end when God is in charge. It's not the end. Asking the kids earlier about um, thinking about what they do for God. The truth of that is sometimes as adults, sometimes we've made so many mistakes. Perhaps we have stopped saying, God, what can I do for you? We've given up trying. Or we manage 
the level that we try. Well, God, I'll do something little because I can manage that. I'm big enough to carry that on my own. So actually, then you're not even really doing it in the spirit because you're doing it in your own flesh, aren't you? And we say to our kids, try. And you know, those of you with kids or grandkids or other people's kids, those of you that see what kids do, you know, sometimes they do something and they fail and they go, oh, I'll never do that again. You know, I had that the other day with Isaac and I was like, don't laugh, don't laugh because it's silly and it's simple. But sometimes as adults, our spiritual attitudes can be like that. We make a mistake. Oh, I'm never going to try this again. And we quit. We give up. Failure takes us back to these childhood moments where we fail at something and we have a choice. Do we quit? Do we throw our toys out the pram? Do we have a hissy fit? Do we blame others? Do we treat ourselves badly, others badly because of failure? Sometimes. The disciples did all those things. But you know what? Failure is as important as success in terms of learning. Because we measure our Christian maturity often through the way that we respond in failure. It's true. At the heart of this story in John 21, it's not about failing disciples. It's about a risen and exalted Jesus who's bigger than people's failures, who is in past what we mess up, who is capable and in invitational enough to say, look, you make mistakes, but come and follow me. It's okay. Come on, follow me. Despite their constant mess ups and our constant mess ups, those who respond to God rightly enter not a place where failure reigns, but a place where he reigns. And what he says is possible is possible. So you know what? Failure has as much value if we learn from our mistakes, if we're honest and own up. Failure is often a, t a time where look at our current government they have a fair number of failures. And each time they are very successful in blaming someone else for the reasons they failed and hence never learn any real lessons. And you and I could be the same. Well, this failed because they did. This failed because they did. But we can't control they, but we can control ourselves. So failure can be as much value as success if we learn from our mistakes. In fact, sometimes when we succeed, it's less valuable than failure because we cross that line, we're through it, and we're like, yes, we don't think about it so much. Failure allows us res reflective moments to grow with God, to have a moment or a thousand where we say, you know what, God, I don't want to keep doing it. Paul says this, I keep doing the things I don't want to do, and the things I want to do, I don't do. But Paul didn't say, oh, well, shh. he said, but look, God is bigger than that. He's bigger than me. And if I trust him, I can get through that. So if we take failure and the chance to reflect on it, that can become a growing place with God if we listen to his way. Peter and those others messed up time and time again. What's good, you know, is at the end of the scriptures, we see their ends. And Peter and the disciples are very much unique in the Bible. Because if you, I haven't done it, but if you look at um, research into set failure and success in scripture, at least 70% of all of the people in your Bible end their lives in failure. At least 70%. But not Peter and the disciples. Because God has hold of them. The Holy Spirit is central to their lives. And you see, as you read the other letters, what happened? Yes, they died. They died, but in Acts, the first time they got punched and hit and beaten, they rejoiced that they were worthy to suffer for their Lord. So they didn't mind the suffering because they knew they'd stepped into the victory of Jesus. And so they ended well in trust and in faith. So what about us? What are, what are we going to do? For God. Now you've done things for God, but what are you still going to do for God? How do you want to live for God? You know, you haven't always succeeded in the service of God. That's true, nor have I. None of us have.
but failures will come again. What are we going to do as we step forward into life? Are we going to forget what Jesus has said? Are we going to run away and go fishing? Or are we going to turn around and say, Lord, I make mistakes, but you are perfect. Help me to walk in your way. Help me to be engaged in the things that you want me to do. Because you know what? In life, there are endless things that we can do. You've got more choices. I was thinking about the coronation. I enjoyed aspects of it. Um, and I'm, no doubt you did. And many of us had the freedom to sit around and watch it all the time if we wanted. And that was nice. But not everybody in our world has that freedom. So what are we going to do with the freedoms we have before God? What are we going to do? Are we going to keep pushing forward into the victory that God has called us into? Or will we be focused on the things that don't matter? You know, life is not easy. It's not perfect. Many of the ways we shouldn't live, we do. But what do we do? Do we shrug our shoulders and say, that's just the way it is? I hope not. Jesus said to those boys, come and follow me. That's what he's saying to us today, every day. Come and follow me. Near the end, even after what Jesus said, which is so good, Peter almost loses the plot. And he turns to, uh, looks at John and says, what about him? And Jesus says, forget him. Don't worry about what he's doing. He wants to be here till I come back. I can make that happen. Forget him. You follow me. So we're failures. Forget that. Let's follow Jesus. We are loved by our identity, not by our activity. And that's a good job. We are loved because God has first loved us. When we get it right, he's to be praised. When we get it wrong, he's to be praised. And if we've made mistakes, we have to accept responsibility for those things. But when we fail, where we fail, let's grow up. Let's trust God today. Let's press into the word and to the spirit. And let's find God's way. You know what? If there's no fish on that side of the boat, Jesus, where do we cast our nets then? Where do we find the fish that you're calling us to catch? John 21, Jesus is the victorious one. Let's trust in him and let's know it's okay to be failures because God is in charge. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to sing our closing song. We're going to sing, um, you laid aside your majesty. You tell us.